Welcome to the Spa Girls podcast, the self-publishing podcast for authors. You're in the right place for the best writing, marketing and publishing advice, plus interviews with industry experts and best-selling authors. I'm Cheryl Phipps. I'm Wendy Valor. And I'm Trudy Jay. And this mm-hmm. week we have Kim Boo York. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Spa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Yay. Um, so we're going to talk about discovery writing with you, which is a really intriguing topic. And we haven't actually talked about it yet. We, we sort of realized no, in the spa. No. But first, I'm going to read out your bio, uh, Kimbu, and then we will get right into it. So Sounds good. Kimbu York is a Gen X elder goth whose main purpose is to provide a good life for her rescue mutt, Keely Boo who is perfect and beyond reproach in every way. Aren't they all? Aren't they all <laughs> perfect and beyond reproach? Yeah. Um, Kim Boo is also a librarian. I'm super excited about this, by the way. Former project yeah. manager and a professional <laughs> author who wears too many hats and crosses too many genres, including romance, fantasy, and nonfiction. She's a bit grumpy, especially in the morning. And thankfully for us, it's our morning, but it's your afternoon, Kim Boo, so we're okay. That's right. And look at that smile. She's happy. <laughs> I've had enough coffee at this point in the day, so I'm doing good. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. Phew. Oh my gosh. Okay, so um, well, let's just get started by asking a little bit of your background. Like, tell us how you got into writing and and self publishing, and and you know, give us your your origin story, and then we'll go from sure. there. Sure. Well, I'm one of the bog standards. You know, I was with the little girl who was going to be a writer, and right, been writing stories pretty much all my life. I kind of gave up on the idea of being a professional author when in the 90s because you know at that point I was in my 20s going into my 30s um, the industry was so different back then it was all traditional you had to get an agent you had to get on the shelves at at Barnes and Nobles or Borders if anybody remembers those stores at least here in the U.S. and so the stories that I wanted to write I didn't think would sell and that I wouldn't be able to I, I tried I did a little bit of trying but it was just like I knew it wasn't going to happen down the road <laughs> as life as times change the the starting point for me getting back into writing and writing professionally was surprisingly fan fiction and i talk about this in a lot of different places so some people already know this, some people don't but when i was going through a really rough time in my life i fell back into the fan fiction community which i had not been in for many years like i i was a very young fangirl and then i dropped out of fandom got back into it about 2007 2008 and that got that reignited my love of writing outside because I had been working as a journalist. I'd done some freelance work. I was in the IT industry. I was skipping around just like a typical Gen X or, you know, loser, just going from job to job. <laughs> I loved the writing. I loved the stories. And a couple of people who were in fandoms with me actually went and got published by a indie publishing company. So they said, we we love your work. Write something original and submit it. And I was like, sure, why not? Like throw it out the window, see what sticks. And it did. They actually accepted my stories. I had several books published by them. Uh, We eventually had to go our separate ways. I got the rights back to my stories at that time and the novels. And I decided to try self-publishing them. Now I had done a little bit of self-publishing previously with my memoir, uh, Grieving Futures, surviving the deaths of my parents which is as depressing as it sounds uh, so I, I i would just i figured i would self-publish that because who who else would want to read it anyway i just wanted it out there mostly for friends and family uh, but i that experience led me to realize that i could do it with my own books so fast forward 2016 2018 i'm um self-publishing my backlog and I'm really getting back into the love of writing and the love of telling my own stories and these days I've gone a little bit into not a little bit I've gone whole hog into subscription based Um, I'm on ream I've got my own blog that people can subscribe to so things have changed a lot but it's still me enjoying telling the stories that I want to tell which is all I've ever wanted to do since I was writing um, you know, Jack London fan fiction when I was seven. Like, it's oh, so cute. sad. Y'all, so sad. It was <laughs> no, tragic. It was stop it. Stop. Truly, truly <laughs> terrible. Uh, you know, and then straight into Star Wars and Star Trek. Like, it, the love is still there. And yeah. so that's yeah. where I come from with my writing. And I just it's, I just want to keep telling the stories. A great it's, story. 
it's yeah. kind of cool. There's lots of different authors that we've had on that talk about starting out in fan fiction. That's it's mm. a it's a mm. kind of interesting. Yeah, we well, want to extend I, I think... our favorite favorite worlds. Yeah, mm. and there's so much I could say there. I don't want to derail it, but I will say, what's different now is that a lot of more authors feel comfortable saying that they started out like yeah. you're 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 going yeah. back 10 mm. 20 years there were still mm. a lot of authors who got started writing fan fiction they were mm. just scrubbing the serial numbers off they were doing it under pseudonyms they were never admitting it in public mm. and mm. these days we're much more comfortable saying yeah man i love fan fiction you ain't taking mm. that away from me yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's true yeah. it's so it's such an improvement so yeah awesome. changed so much yeah yeah that's yeah. awesome so can I just say before we go on any further how cool your website name is? I want that oh, website name. She's, she's been raving about it this morning. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I, cool. I do it. It's it's all it's all DIY. I do all my own websites and all my all my own graphics yeah. and everything. I'm so, so jealous every time somebody sees something like that. Yeah, I'm just about like, websites. Yeah. I'm like uh, just... <laughs> y'all, y'all. I've been doing websites since 1996. So wow. you know, it's <laughs> You'd be uh, handy to have I, it around. Mm. Ah, you know, sometimes I wish I didn't because it's a lot of work. Don't yeah. you know, I'm not going to lie yeah. about that. But I've been yeah. doing it for a while. Yeah. Thank you, though. Nice Thank work. you so much, Wendy. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, no worries. So back on track now, people. Um, Sorry. Actually, I'm <laughs> going to take us off track again because I want to quickly talk. So you, you've you got, um, <laughs> you're a librarian. So I yeah. love this idea. Um, so does that help your writing at all? Like how, like what was, how did that, yeah, tell us. Ah, so the reason I'm a librarian and if you have any li li so like librarians who are listening to this podcast will get the joke, but I, the reason I'm a, I'm a librarian is because I love books. Now, the reason that that's a joke is because library science, library studies isn't really about books. It's all about information and data. It's about mm -hmm. information literacy and, and eBooks. And so, yeah. But I just I just love books. And so when I went in to become a librarian, the reason I did was I actually wanted to work in archives and rare book collections. And that's oh. the focus of my library uh, school studies was the history, what, what is called the history of text technology, or more commonly known as the history of the book. And so that really does inform a lot of my writing because I love how the technology affects culture. And you don't get certain cultures because they don't have certain technologies. Uh, and some cultures develop in certain ways because they have certain technologies. And I'd be very vague because there's just so much there that I could go into and I could, mm -hmm. again, derail the conversation. So does it affect my writing? Absolutely. And in fact, <laughs> sometimes a little bit more directly than others, like the the most recent serial that I've started uh, Dragon Scrail is about a middle age. It's a fantasy novel. It's a it's very much a fantasy second world fantasy novel, and it's about a middle aged librarian of like a monastic library, and how she gets tossed out into the world of magic and dragons, and so you know using some of my own experiences to play into her experience. So that's the direct connection. Yeah. But I just love the history of books. I love how books are made. I love how books are used. I love how the technology is changing on what is a book and so yeah so it just affects everything that I do okay. really that's it's fascinating I had never I'd never thought about it like that in my head mm -hmm. librarian means that you just get to mm -hmm. hang out with books all day and Magical. not that it's about the <laughs> the data and the yeah. information and the organization of it I suppose too right like the mm -hmm. where on the shelf should this book go rather than Look, you I love this book you want to talk about taxonomy which is what that is then we, we can do that no, you can do that right now. No, <laughs> no but I give in. I did right. I just <laughs> just did want to clarify that the connection between you and the the woman that you've written about in your book has nothing to do with you personally having a dragon. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I really can't answer that right now at this time. So <laughs> I'm just wondering what's behind the screen. That's all. Just mm. Asking for a friend. <laughs> Don't look. There's nothing behind the screen. Nothing to see here. <laughs> Okay, quick, we better get back on before we give away uh, the Are we on track? Thing. We'll never get yeah. on track. All yeah, right. No. So, so the topic for today is discovery writing. Now, mm. among us, we have Wendy, who is a pantser. So she is listening with all ears on this one. Um, she is sort of both. Aren't yeah, you? she's yeah. a half and halfer. I'm an all yeah. over the shower. Um, probably more of a plotter than a pantser. Um, 
okay so but let's start in the beginning what is discovery writing tell us exactly what it is discovery writing is writing from a place of curiosity without guardrails so you're going into the story answer a question who is the character where are they going what have they experienced you may have an inkling you may have an idea of what the character is or the setting. A lot of uh, discovery writers or pantsers I know start with a scene in their head and then they have to build up mm. from there. And so they are doing so without, and I hate using the word restrictions because there's, as I'll get into it, I'll talk, it, there's nothing wrong with outlining either, but in their mind, it would be a restriction. It would be a constriction to use something like an outline or a summary. They want to follow the story where their intuition and their instincts take them. And that is what discovery writing is all about. That just sounds scary. I'm just, I'm getting the, like the scary jibbies. <laughs> when you sounds pretty that. normal to me. Yeah. yeah. Whereas these two are like, yeah, whatever. Every day. Um, so... Every day is a wonder. I have no idea what's coming out. No, right? <laughs> Things can change while you're in the shower. You can... Yeah, it's like, oh my God, that. Yeah. That's exactly where that needs to go. <laughs> yeah. So is it is it always about the character or is it, could it be there's a situation like, or a conflict that they start with like or does it is the character the better place to start do you think it's and, and my answer to that it is depends on the writer so the basic construct and what i explain in my book by the seat of your pants is that discovery writing is a technique and it, it's a technique in the same way that outlining is a technique so there's no one right way to outline is just as there's no one correct story beat it's like you've got the hero's journey and save the cat and the three act structure. Those are all outlines. Those are all story beats. It doesn't matter which one you use, they fall under that umbrella. And so with discovery writing, it is a technique. And so there are lots of different ways to use that technique. And so for me personally, I usually start with a scenario with a character in it and I focus on that character. And then I build the scenario out and figure out why is this character you know, in the quicksand next to the train track. I don't know, but I got to figure it out. I'm curious. And that's what drives me. Some uh, people who use discovery writing have a theme or an arc that they want to tell. Uh, my friend Gina Hogan Edwards, she's writing historical fiction and she has a young girl as the, one of the main characters in her story. And she kind of had a scene that was like, the end of the book, but it it culminated in the story arc. And so she's had to work backwards to figure out how the girl got there. And so oftentimes it does involve the character, but I don't think it always does. And I think a lot depends on the specific discovery writing technique that the author is using and their own personal preferences and inclinations. Some of us just lean heavily into dialogue, for instance, others lean heavily into descriptions, mm -hmm. and that can also affect how you use discovery writing as a technique. Mm. What what occurs to me is that in this situation, a beginner writer might go, okay, I've got this person standing on the side of the road with nothing around them. Whereas you talked about why is this character in the quicksand by the train tracks? And so mm. as a more experienced writer, you're putting this character into a into a situation that's kind of um dramatic, has a has a time limit, you know, like they've got to get out of the situation before they get sucked down into into the quicksand, you know, all of these things. So can you talk a bit about that? Like like when you're beginning with this character, do you have to have a conflict there or is it a situation or is it a something or how usually you... it's a situation. I think what you're talking about is is actually so discovery writing is a technique I found tends to happen with very new writers, very inexperienced writers, because they have an idea, they're grabbed by something. And so they're going to jump in, they're going to write the story mm -hmm. and they have no clue what they're doing. And, you know, Cause they've either never written a novel before, or they've only just dabbled with writing before. And then there's discovery writers, you know, like Wendy and Cheryl and myself, who spent years studying our craft, reading other people's novels, reading books, reading craft books. And we have a very strong intuition about what should happen. Mm. And discovery writing technique as a technique works best for people who are really 
have a strong intuition for storytelling Mm -hmm. that might come naturally, but it might not. So to circle back around to your question, if a newbie writer is coming into this and they just have a character they really like, and they're setting them in the middle of a scene, but they don't know what to do with that character, then they're probably just going to write a lot of info dumping Mm -hmm. and it's not going to be a good story, right? It's still discovery writing, but they don't have the skill set yet. So in that situation, Sometimes the answer is, you know, back up, pull out, write an outline, do some character analysis sheets, the old fashioned way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is just to keep writing all the way through until you get something where you can actually start working with it. Uh, Very rarely do I find with discovery writers, do they come into it with just kind of a blank slate? Like, I just want to write about, you know, this kid usually there's some kind of impetus uh like you said like a conflict or a dangerous situation Mm -hmm. or a relationship going sour or you know if it's if it's a more literary work you know the the person's thinking about self-harm or something like that which would kick the story off for a discovery writer Mm -hmm. Um, but again it really does boil down to how much intuition how much you've you've honed your intuition how much you've honed your craft and where you're coming from as a writer that can really affect how successful the discovery writing is going to be for you. Yeah. How do you hone your intuition? Uh, so Becca Sam talks about this a lot. And um, I think when I read her book, Dear Writer, Are You Intuitive? That really helped me figure out why discovery writing could work. So the way that you hone your intuition um, is do a lot of studying like it's like you've got to read other novels you've got to watch good movies you've got to watch good storytelling good plays because what you're doing is you're you're interiorizing your familiarity with well, how to tell a good story mm-hmm. and studying craft books absolutely critical that will help you a lot but experiencing the stories and noticing the things that you're feeling as you read the stories consciously with purpose rather than as i'm reading a book for fun it's like i'm reading this book because i want to know what how they did that and like for instance i'll give an example uh i recently well last year read victoria goddard's hands of the emperor and my first read through on that book was just like this is amazing what is going on here and then i was like how did she do that how <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> so i had to go back and actually i did i did create outlines or anything but as i read the book i was like oh this is an emotional peak oh this is a cliffhanger here's where she brought in this character here's where Mm. she brought in that and all of that hones your intuition it's just like playing a sport if you play a sport long enough you will know what the ball is doing when it's coming towards you because you've seen it so often that your Mm. instinct is telling you oh it's going to curve to the left just because you're watching the the trajectory you know how it's been thrown you, you can't really explain why unless, you yeah. know, you sit down with a replay, but that's kind of how you have to work with intuition. It's not just something you can learn in a textbook. It's very ex- experiential. Yeah. And I, I think as authors, we read books differently now, like at least mm-hmm. I do. And I'm sure yeah, you guys do definitely. too. Mm-hmm. Like you read a book and you kind of, I'm sitting there going, wow, that was so well done. I liked how mm-hmm. they did that, that, and that. I found that a little bit with um, the beginning of fourth wing, where I came in oh, and yeah. I, was, I was just so appreciative for how some of the the setup for the beginning of that book mm-hmm. like I just was like she's doing this so well I'm I'm yeah. drawn in already and I I could feel it but I was also kind of like there was this little voice at the back of my mind going appreciating it as an author as well like what she was yeah. doing so mm-hmm. um I can exactly see she that. was she was really clever yeah, yeah. Uh, about getting the backstory out when he you know mm-hmm. with the way she was talking and stuff she was very smart mm-hmm. yeah I love that book anyway yeah, very good um okay so that's cool so if someone is starting out and they want to try discovery writing um probably they've got an idea is what you're saying mm-hmm. they've, they've got they've got probably, this place yeah. of, probably <laughs> maybe hopefully. so hopefully <laughs> um let's talk about assume they have so where do they start like and it's kind of in a no rule situation right like you're talking about mm. what, whatever works best for you so for me it's I know well, that I start at the yeah. beginning but mm. but that's not even you don't even have to start at the beginning right no 
So when I say discovery writing is a technique and there are different techniques that you can use, for instance, start mm -hmm. at the beginning and write all the way through, uh, Dean Wesley Smith, who is a discovery writer, a pantser himself, uses that and promotes that method. He's like, just sit down, write, start at the beginning, and write all the way through. Uh, that works really well for him because he's been writing for close to 50 years. He's got some pretty good intuition going there. Yeah. Uh, it, it can be a disaster for people who have not, do not have that kind of experience, but it is a good place if you do have the beginning in mind. In my book, I talk about the different ways to be a discovery writer, and I give exercises about things you can do to build up your discovery writing skill set. So, for instance, one of them is so i uh, before i go into it i think i need to really explain the difference between um free association writing and discovery writing because a lot of critics of discovery writing say it's just free association writing and it's not <clears throat> free association writing is genuinely no no expectations no no plans no any kind of structure in mind no thoughts you're it's it's trying to connect with your innermost um subconscious and it's a very powerful tool i i do for especially for journaling it's great discovery writing always has a purpose it has a story that's going to be told it has a character that wants to be told talked about the, uh, that the author wants to explain a, a character arc that the author wants the character to go through it's not completely without any rules or any map whatsoever there's usually a good idea what you want to do mm -hmm. So for instance, one of the exercises I have is basically to think of a story prompt or if your character you already know of or a scenario you already have in mind and very simply build up your skill set. You write for five to 10 minutes with absolutely no outline. Mm -hmm. The next time you sit down, which could be later that day, could be the next day, could be the next week, you write for 15 to 20 minutes. But here's the trick. You read over what you wrote, you don't edit it, and you start writing immediately the next scene. You're okay. not allowed to plan anything out. You're not allowed. You're just reading what you wrote, and then you write the next thing. And you get, you do that multiple times until you're writing at least 30 minutes to 45 minutes of just discovery writing, which is just you read what you wrote, and then you write the next scene. <laughs> this help builds up the skill set because what that's going to show you, and this is the important part, what that's this, an exercise like that is going to show you is that where your weaknesses are. Are you stumbling into info dumps and backstory dumps? Are you getting lost in the witty banter and never moving the plot forward? Like you will be able to see if you're doing something like that purposefully where you need to brush up on your own skills as a writer to incorporate that in your discovery writing. And because you're doing it in measured chunks, you're not going to be carried away and, and fall down the rabbit hole that you might otherwise, if it was just completely untimed. Mm -hmm. So there's other exercises in the book. And that's a good one. I think for people to start with, mm -hmm. I have some other exercises that are more prompt focused, um, <laughs> that are a little bit trickier. Like you write a, you write to a prompt and then you write a paragraph, but then you pick a completely different prompt and that has to be the next paragraph. And oh, so, it, yeah, mm, yeah, the, that's, that's a good one because it really just, it's out of the blue. You've got to think of how to solve this problem. I think a lot of discovery writing is actually going in and driven by curiosity, you're problem solving. <laughs> like, mm. Oh, how, how did they get down the well and how are they going to get out? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> They're going to call the dragon? What are they going to do? Uh, so, And I don't know. It's a writer. I don't know. I have uh, uh, one of my Dragon's Girl arc series is the Pirate's Witch. Now, I know the title, and I know it's going to be on a river, but I don't know who the Pirate Witch is. I don't know if she's good or if she's bad. I don't know any of that. But I know that that's something that's going to be important in that particular story arc. Yeah. So mm. that's the fun part for wow. me. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that's a that's a difference between the the plotting and the pantsing. Is a mm. a plotter would be horrified and terrified, and mm -hmm. a pantser is excited and mm. and um mm. and kind of finds it challenging, right. but in an exciting way. But it kind of adds to the adds yeah. to it rather than yeah yeah, yeah. exactly yeah and that's just different, different. Yeah, yeah it's just different people to have different mm. brains where it's I not know, like I mean it's wrong. I, yeah, I think all of us would love to be plotters. 
I'll be honest. Yeah, no, I feel like <laughs> I, I should tried save time, but so yeah. Hard. I, I tried, tried so hard everything. to be. I've mm-hmm. tried, tried everything. I feel like Trudy, I really, I plotted, feel... plotted one day with Trudy a whole book and I never wrote that book because I just didn't want to. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. But before yep, I start so a book, common. I know exactly where I'm going and rah, 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 mm-hmm. it's all in my head. But yeah, I'd love to be that person. How cool. Mm-hmm. Just sit down and go, yeah. chapter one, chapter like two. I'm, I'm in a Pants yeah. Anonymous meeting right now and you mm-hmm. guys are like, I thought we were talking <laughs> my, my about how dis- Kimbu. <laughs> yeah. I, we're, we're talking here about how awesome discovery writing is and how That's much brilliant. we want to yeah. continue using it. One thing I do know about Wendy, for example, is that she will write like, you know, 30,000, 40,000 words in, and then she'll kind of go back to the beginning and start again mm, and, and kind common. of edit and re. And then she will cu- cull, just casually, casually cull 30K words out of mm. her. Out of her. Cheryl does that too, but she has a folder that she puts her culled words into. Yeah. She can't. Never to be quite, seen again. She can't <laughs> quite let go of I them. Can't, no. I'll just go no. delete. I, so you just I, delete I, them, that, Wendy. Oh, no. Absolutely oh, gone. Geez. Gone into the ether. <laughs> That is that is not uncommon. So my my rule of thumb is I usually don't know who my characters are until I'm about thirty thousand words in, mm-hmm. um, and and in one of the chapters or one of the sections in my book, it's called you know the, the darlings that you kill or kill your darlings, because if you're going to be a discovery writer, if you're going to practice discovery writing techniques, yes, you're going to have to get used to throwing out words mm-hmm. and just yeah. like thirty thousand words. Man, I've thr- I've thrown out fifty thousand words. Like I've, just like, whole uh, chapters. Yeah. I've just yeah, gone whole Carl, chapters. Gone. Book for yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, just no, I can't do that. Yeah. So I do save it though, like more like Cheryl. I'm like, mm. oh, well, maybe I could repurpose it somehow, and I never yeah. do, but I I yeah. save it. <laughs> no, no, I'm really character driven, so I have to have mm. all the names are what take me the longest. To be honest, I can spend two weeks looking for a name. Oh my gosh, yeah, mm. right. Mm. I'm I'm trying to name a character right now, and I've got his first name, and I'm like, just this must be the 17th last name I've given him. My surname mm-hmm. I've given him. I don't. That's oh, that, thank, with it. thank goodness for find and replace. <laughs> yes, <laughs> even yes. though it can muck up a lot of things. <laughs> mm. Oh my, my gosh, just thinking about writing a book, and my son was as well, and and they were like oh how do we do it mum and I'm just like wow really <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea just sit I'm down just and down it comes and out and then you <laughs> work out what's no, but, what's bad. but they yeah. will both be plotters yeah I guarantee you yeah yeah your daughter mm. will be a plotter 100 percent. absolutely 100 yeah. percent. she's a project manager <laughs> although actually that was the question we had Cheryl, yes do you want to ask him oh sure um so earlier um we were talking to Kimbu about the fact that in her previous lives mm-hmm. she was a project manager over various careers and I just wonder how that can possibly um, sit alongside the fact of um, discovery writing because they just seem so polar opposite <clears throat> because two things that discovery writing and project management can have in common I don't think this is going to be true for everybody obviously but for me it is it's that you putting things to organizational buckets. Now, in project management, you put things into organizational buckets and then you break them down and assign mm-hmm. them tasks and put them on a uh, on a you know calendar and have due dates and deadlines. But the general, the very basic principle of project management is super simple. It's just five steps, and you just put these things into these general buckets, and then you go from there. Uh, for me, as a discovery writer, and this this a lot of people find this very ironic, I lean heavily into story beats systems. There's a difference between outlining and using story beats. Outlining says specifically what's going to happen in the next scene. The story beat will just be inciting event. And like, I don't know what the inciting event's going to be. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't exactly know who's going to be involved, but I know that I need to have the inciting event in the next thing. And so for me, it's actually very easily to move back and forth between those two worlds, because to Mm -hmm. me, it's about the organizational buckets and how things are put together. And I just have a very, very uh, structural mind. (laughs) Uh, My other book previous to this was Become an Unstoppable Storyteller. And it was based on a spreadsheet I did of story beats for long running serials. And man, I love doing a good spreadsheet. I just really do. (laughs) Like, I don't know why. (laughs) Uh, But if you sat me down and tried to say, okay, well, here's how your story, here's what chapter one is going to be. Here's what chapter two is going to be. I'd just be like, ah, I can't do that. Sorry. I've got to 
feel my way through the story. So I don't think they're as unalike as for me, as I use discovery writing, as a lot of people think. Um, but uh, also, I think a lot of people have the image of uh, project management as, you know, very, very strict deadlines, mm. Gantt charts. And yes, that's a side of project management. Absolutely, that's important and, and factors in a lot of project manage, managing. But at heart, it's just more about the simple structure of having everything in its place. So that's yes. that's my yes. answer to that one. Can, can we ask <laughs> perhaps what the uh, five buckets are? Mm. Sure. So the five bucket, the first bucket is um, ideation. It's having an idea of what you want to do. And uh, usually at this point, it's it's visioning what the end goal will look like a lot of times. Uh, two is planning. Um, at the planning stage, you're creating a budget, you're figuring out the timeline, you're just figuring out what needs to happen. Um, the third stage is, um, it, <laughs> excuse me, the third stage is um, the ongoing doing the project. It is the doing of the thing. It is the building of the building. It is making the software. It is whatever you're doing, right? And usually that's the longest running stage because that takes the most time. Uh, the fourth stage is ending the project. And the fifth stage is uh, analysis or um, after action reporting is figuring out what you did, did work, what didn't work, what you're gonna to have to change if you're gonna do it again. Those are the buckets. Some project management systems have four buckets. Some have slightly different labels for the five buckets, but mm -hmm. essentially those are it. It's, you know, ideation, planning, instigation, resolution, and um, analysis. That's it. That's project yeah. management. You are now all qualified project managers. Congratulations. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if I need a second career, I'm there. Yeah. There you go. Sorry. You're ready to roll. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you, Judy. Judy. I've muted. Sorry, sorry. I muted uh, myself because there was a uh -huh. siren going off. Um, as I feel like, as authors, we are project managers anyway. Like we are managing mm -hmm. ourselves yep. through. Um, mm -hmm. yep. What I find fascinating about the five is that end ending a project is a, is one of the buckets. Like it sort of feels like sometimes like it's to me it's like oh I can't quite bring myself to end stuff, and so <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to me that there's a bucket for it to kind of remind you to actually finish. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah you just have to say. You do so, often say, yeah. I can't get this book to end, Yeah, which is quite yeah. funny considering you're the plotter in the group. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I struggle with endings. Like I literally just finished edits on a book this morning. And I'm like, have I ended it in the right place? I don't know. I'm not sure. But that, we're second guesses. Rice is a second guess. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so if you read it long enough, you just get tired of it, don't you? Just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I just make it away. away. <laughs> you know, it, so my solution to that was to move to slide into writing long running serials. So I right. don't really plan on ever ending my stories. It's super yeah, convenient. Yeah, that <laughs> makes sense. There you go, Trudels. That would work for you. Yeah. Long running serials do. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Then I'd have to remember all the things. No, no. Yeah, you do. Uh, no, sure. no, no, no. <laughs> I have two questions. First one is is about your so the it's intriguing to me because you there's the dichotomy around discovery writing, but also mm. you 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 do have a structure in there. Like you you it is right. And maybe for some people it's completely free flowing, but what you're talking about for your particular brand of discovery writing is that you are doing it within a kind of structure in that mm -hmm. you know that there needs to be an inciting incident. You know that maybe you get to halfway point and there needs to be something happening there or that there needs, I don't know if you have a um, the black moment where everything goes wrong and, and disaster strikes or the, you know, like all those kinds of things that are a part of plotting. Is that something, do you think about it that um, consciously or is it just something that almost subconsciously happens because your intuition knows how to put together a good story? Uh, it's on the front end, it's intuition. I do not sit down with the plot, with the, with a, with a beat structure and say, oh, I'm going to use save the cat and I'm going to do this. And these are going to be my, you know, 47 steps. I don't do that. I sit down, I start writing the story, I get into the story, I learn who the characters are by the, usually by the 30,000 word mark, I have a much better grasp of who the characters are and what the theme is and where it's going. Then I will keep writing it. 
usually when I get about two thirds of the way in, now this is for a novel, not a long running serial, but for a novel, get two thirds of the way in, that's when I'll sit back and actually put on the, you know, the beats lenses of my glasses and look at, am I filling the beats? Am I, am I, mm -hmm. am I fulfilling the reader promise? You know, am, are the beats consistent? Is, did something happen too early? Is something happening too late? At that point I might start shuffling things around. So it's, it's a little bit of both. And again, like many writers do it, do discovery differently. Uh, one method of being a discovery writer is what I call the puzzle master. There's someone who will write out of order and they'll create all these little plot points uh, and then they'll write between them. They'll fill in between them. And sometimes they never use a beat structure or an outline or, you know, they never go back and do a reverse outline or anything like that because they've spent so much time building those bridges between those plot points that they're very confident and they about what they've created. So it really just depends on your technique. For me, mm -hmm. the beats are a way for me to fine tune the story. And I think I've internalized it because I have studied, you know, I really have been studying literature and writing since I was a little girl. So I, I admit I have a little mm -hmm. bit of a jump start on a lot of people, but I think anybody can learn that. Like that's not, that's like, oh, you too late for you. No, that's not mm -hmm. what I'm saying. But <laughs> uh, for me, it is very internalized because mm -hmm. of that. Um, yeah. Other people might need to to approach it a little differently. Um, but I guess the message that I really, 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 the reason I wrote the book, y'all, it's because I want people to understand that how they approach writing is acceptable. It's mm -hmm. fine. Are you using an outline? That's great. Are you, can you not use an outline? Like when, I'm like Wendy, if I use an outline, my brain is convinced that I wrote the story and it loses complete. I, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I've tried. Like I write the outline. It's a great outline. I need to sell it because I'm never going to write that. <laughs> it's like there's yeah. nothing to do with that anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't matter if you are writing a good story and you are fulfilling the reader promise and you are finding joy in the process there's no real wrong way to do it if you're hitting those marks. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really want people to come away with from my book. It's just understanding the way you're doing it. Yeah, it's a lot of people make fun of pantsers and and certainly, you know, uh, established authors, established writing teachers will put their nose up at you and say you're doing it all wrong. But you're not if what you're doing is creating the product, the story, the book, the novel, the serial that you want to tell. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty passionate about that, if you can't tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. And and I mean, you're even more vindicated when your books sell because yes, clearly exactly. what you're doing is appealing. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, people people love the story and, you know, every story could be better. Like, it's just like, that's just the nature of the business. You can always mm. go back and rewrite it and, re yeah. and polish it. It's, but if your readers are loving it and you're mm. loving the act of writing it, and people are buying it and it's the circle is completed then heck yeah. you're doing it great you're doing yeah. great you're mm -hmm. doing it right no yeah. problems perfect mm. even if no one's buying it i guess as long as you're creating stories that you are loving do you know what i mean like as long as you yeah that's i i learned that in fan fiction because there are definitely um fandoms that are super tiny small uh some that you know i've never heard of and you'll go in there and there'll be only 30 stories written in that fandom, which for regular fandoms is an incredibly small number of stories. But you know what? Those 30 stories were written with love and they were written yeah. by somebody who loves mm. the property and loves those characters. That's enough. That's mm. enough. And if yeah. it's your original stories and three people read it, three people buy your book, the, you've made those three people happy. Then okay, mm. you've mm. done it. Success. Good for you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. that's awesome. 100 100 percent. okay so um i had another question oh yeah so what if we get stuck this is my question <laughs> so you get to like halfway and you're like oh no i'm lost what do i do <laughs> help. help me help me kimbu help me <laughs> well there's several things to do when you get lost or you get stuck or you write yourself into a corner which is most pantsers talk about it that way mm. i mean I, you know like i was talking earlier you, you they're at the bottom of the well the dragon left town nobody there's, there's no, no way there's no rope there's no way out we're just stuck in this you know um there's several different things and it all depends on what the real problem is so if you're stuck in a situation where you've written yourself into a corner 
or found your characters at the bottom of a well, whatever it is, step back a little bit. First exercise to do is to reread your entire story from front to end, not as a writer. This is a mindset thing. This is a mindset thing because what you have to do is you have to read it as a reader. Mm -hmm. You have to like get yourself, don't read it where you normally write. Put it in a on your phone or print it out and go to the backyard or go to the kitchen or go somewhere mm -hmm. where you don't normally write. Read it as a reader. Look for the emotional satisfaction of what you're reading, the character arcs, like, are you enjoying the story? What you're going to find a lot of times is that you've dropped something along the way. Yeah. Um, it Sometimes it's like two chapters earlier, like a good rule of thumb is just go back two chapters. And yeah, you know, as Wendy and I both know, and Cheryl as well, you you might end up throwing out the two chapters that came after that got them in the well because they were never supposed to be in the well. And the be like, Trudy's like, no, 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 don't, 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 don't. Um, Other times, and this is one I talk about in my story, you may realize you just you just broke all the rules. Like I killed the antagonist of the story, the bad guy, the villain. And this was like a Cape Fear type of story. This was a stalkerly thriller story. And I had the guy killed off like two thirds of the way through the love romance arc of the main characters. So all the tension just fell apart because well, now the bad guy's dead. And yeah. I was sitting there and I'm like, no <laughs> like <laughs> these don't line Aww. up at all like no like it's like it, it you know I joke no. about it. it's like now what right can I yeah. just put the bad guy like on a cruise for two weeks so I can do the romance arc and finish that and then have him come back <laughs> I, but I realized reading it as a reader that I had broken that promise to the reader that this villain was going to be an important part of the story and get his real comeuppance in a dramatic yeah. climactic scene at the end of the book just mm -hmm. kind of sort of passive aggressively killed him off and it's like no mm -hmm. that's not what that needs to happen so you're gonna have to go backwards to go forwards and that yeah. is the real trick when you're discovery writing is oftentimes you will forget to take that left turn in Albuquerque and then you'll have to trap backtrack. Don't be yeah. afraid of it. I think is the important thing. A lot of people get into those corners, get in the bottom of that well and just like, can't solve it. It's everything that's written is there. I'm not going to delete anything. I see you, Trudy. <laughs> I'm not going to delete it. I'm not I would find a secret thing. button, you priest, and there's a secret see? exit to the well and a tunnel yeah. <laughs> that was put in there by... Yeah. By someone, monks, <laughs> the monks that see the well in, and there you go. You, you're a discovery writer. Congratulations, Trudy. You did. <laughs> no, no, she's not. No, 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 she's not. Trust you me. Know what? I am. I am in some ways. I don't. I don't plan everything, but Wendy just mm. thinks I do because I plan more than her, which is well, like a little bit. She plans nothing. Plans more than me in life. <laughs> Let's uh, face it. <laughs> but. It, but it is, it is true that you have to be willing to go back and make some of those sacrifices mm. if you mm. find yourself in that situation. Mm. Now, sometimes you'll find yourself in that situation and just like with Trudy, you'll be like, you know what? The well is part of an old monastery ruins. Mm. I bet there's a secret button to the tunnels that the old hermit on the hill told us about. And so mm. they fiddle around and they find this, mm. you know, mm. you don't know. Sometimes when you go back and you do what I call a reader read through, you'll see some of these little, these little Chekhov's guns or these little mm. things that you, your subconscious mm. put in there yeah. and you're like, Oh, I can use that. I can yeah. get them yeah. out of yeah. the tunnel. Using yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. don't know if you have to back up to know yeah. where you're going to go. Gonna go. Yeah. Quite often. I, if I, if I have a scene like that and it's just not working, I'll just change the point of view too. Like I'll mm, just go from one character one. to another. Mm. Um, and quite often that, that will change everything. And it looks like doing the read aloud, which is, you know, is a funny tinny voice, but actually it does put the, you know, some of the inflection in there to know that that your story just doesn't sound right anyway, mm. even if you think mm -hmm. it's on the right track, it just doesn't sound right. And, uh, yeah, might, yeah might I, well. it's read aloud or, or text to speech reading, mm. which is available in Scrivener, it's mm. available on all the apps. Mm. I mean, it's just real common these days. When I did work at university, I worked in disability services and like back in 2012, that was such expensive software. It wasn't something you could ask authors to do. Yeah, just yeah. have your computer read it aloud yeah. to you. But these days it's so simple. It's a great mm -hmm. way to look for problems, 
not just grammar and sentence structure, but like you said, like looking for mm-hmm. plot holes, looking for things yeah. that just don't ring right when you hear it. Mm-hmm. It's it's a it's the that's a fantastic tool. I recommend mm-hmm. it. And I always use that for my last draft. Always mm, good idea. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And then read it. It's, I think the thing is too with scenes is is working out. Quite often, it's the it's who's the most in character that's got the most invested in a scene. Quite mm-hmm. often, it needs to be the one mm-hmm. talking. Um, mm-hmm. And that's what I've found quite often. I'll get wrong. And then I'll go back and go, ah, Interesting. Huh, wrong uh-huh. character. Switch right. that round. That's mm. that's good. That's good. I'm going to have to remember that because yeah. just switch the it character does work. point of view. Mm. Yeah. It does. It quite often works. It, it just changes the tension, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, being a, um, a writer this way, it gives you license to switch things around, to change things up, whereas mm. you think, I have to do him, her, him, her, and the, you know, if it's a romance, it doesn't actually have to be right. like that. No, it's not set no, it in doesn't. concrete. You know, it's just <laughs> mm. do what you want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially you these got... days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, anything goes, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you've got to have an editor that understands you. I think that's important. So important. So important. Yeah. Yeah. That's critical. <clears throat> Instead of trying to change you, work with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What okay, I've got, got one. Right? I've got one more question on discovery mm-hmm. writing, and then right. I want to I want to talk about project management for authors quickly before we okay, sure. before we disappear. Um, so just it's just what's your favorite part of discovery writing? Like why why, I mean I know you said why you choose it, but like what's I don't know what what's good about it? Why should we be it's, going? It's out? it's like mm-hmm. your own adventure story. Like it's like going into a movie and like you kind of know what's like if you go watch a Star Trek movie, like, you know, who's going to be there, you know, what kind of sort of what's going to happen. And yet still, that's their sense of adventure. It's like, mm, ooh, yeah. Star Trek and the Enterprise and they're going through space and there's going to be a bad guy and there's going to be space battles. And for me, that's the whole feeling that I have when I mm especially when I start a story. Uh, but, but when I lose that feeling, that's that's usually when I know I've lost the thread. Mm-hmm. But that's the, that's the fun part for me. It's, a, I don't know, like a, a dopamine hit, I guess you could mm-hmm. say. It's just, I'm going to find out what happens next. And I'm really excited about that. Mm-hmm. That just yeah. makes it very interesting for me. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, I think, because, um, you know, for me, just getting the title of a book, but mm. especially beginning a new book, I think you have to have that sense of excitement and wonder mm-hmm. because even if you don't know exactly what you're writing, you can see the opportunity, the possibility of what the right. book can be. And I think, right. yeah, I, I like to bring that into starting every book, but also starting the work day, you know, because maybe you haven't thought about where the book is going, but, you know, there's so many different ways you can go, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love yeah, that. I love, I love that. that. Getting yeah. excited about the possibilities. That's what mm. we do as authors. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. See, this All is all in our own ways. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Freaking genius. Um, <clears throat> so so let's talk about project management now that we've talked mm. about the possibilities. Mm. Um mm-hmm. so we, you gave us the five buckets, but how do we use project management as authors? How can we use project management to kind of be more productive or to mm. help us write? I don't know, write more? Is that the (laughs) idea? Yeah, write more, or I would say more productively, because more yes. may not, productive may not be more, mm-hmm. like it really depends on what your personal goals are. So uh, funnily enough, I've also written a book about this. Um, mm-hmm. There's, uh, it's not necessarily for writers, it's called Rise to the Task. It's for my personal, uh, personal projects management system. But it applies to all sorts of projects. And this was one of the things that I really wanted to help people understand. Because when they get into productivity, task management, uh, word counts, people tend to get very wrapped up in the minutia. How many words did I write today? How many scenes did I write today? Um, You know, how many, you know, marketing posts did I do today? And they kind of forget that this is all part of a bigger project. And so when you have a project and you're starting out, it's let's just say, rather than do something very high level, like your business or some your marketing as a project, but just a book, a book is a project, right? So there's the ideation stage, there's the planning stage, there's the, you know, actual action stage, there's the wrap up. When you're looking at these things as stages, and you're looking them as discrete components of a full project, 
it's less, I have to sit down and write this book and write 40, 40 50,000 words in six weeks or 100,000 words in three months or whatever your goal is. You're looking at the entire project. You're looking at what am I creating? What kind of time frame am I looking at? What are the what are the elements of it? So for instance, you'll know that you want to write 100,000 words in three months, but you also know that somebody's going to have to design the cover and somebody's going to have to do the formatting and somebody's going to have to do the marketing and that may that somebody may all be you <laughs> mm-hmm. or it may be your team if you have people that you have do your covers do your formatting do things like that and so you start seeing the bigger picture of how it all fits together and you can start planning more holistically rather than just putting throwing things on your calendar and trying to hit a word count goal because mm-hmm. that's what I see happening is people get very down in the weeds with word count goals or um, launch dates and things. So they get close to the launch date and then they're suddenly like, oh no, I forgot about the cover or, oh no, the cover that I got isn't the one that I want now. And you're like, well, if you had all of this project management, if you had it laid out in these buckets, you'd be able to see at what point in the stage you need to be working on these different elements of it. Mm-hmm. So it's a very structured way of looking at time, but it is less reliant on dates in the calendar or date. Like uh, <laughs> one of the things that I really try to get people to focus on is instead of putting something as a due date on your calendar, Put it as a step in the project because then you're going to see where the next project comes. Now, you may have a due date for the final project, but look at where that thing needs to fall in the process of creating the project. Um, so I hope that wasn't too esoteric or confusing. No, uh, I'm no, not really I think that's, that's great. <laughs> right. Really Sorry, so. How does it, in okay. terms of, uh, yeah, I've got loads of more questions, don't, don't believe. Okay, go I'm on. Really <laughs> um, go for it. So, so, cause when you were talking about, um, so the, the secret so ideation is, you know, thinking up the ideas, right. but the planning one, I was thinking, oh, well, you guys are going to have no planning uh, because you just want to get in and write. But actually you're talking that the planning stage is more about getting mm. the covers, organizing the edits, mm. um, doing all the things around right. the, around the, creation of the book or, or, or right. what will be the final so, so as, as kind of a metaphor like if you're if we're talking if project management for architecture or for um, construction right the planning stage is getting the budget together getting the blueprints together lining up the electrician and the plumber and the concrete guy and knowing that you have to line up the plumber before the concrete guy and the electrician last And Mm -hmm. so these are the types of things that you'll put on the agenda. So for a writer, you'll know that you do need to get the writing done. But also before you finish the writing, you need to line up the cover art because you'll by that point, you'll know what needs to be on the cover and you can hire a cover artist if you're indie. And then last, you're going to be looking at formatting on that particular process. And then you're going to be looking at marketing. So instead of just saying, oh, there's this big ball of stuff I have to do, you're looking at all the different things you need to do in what order they need to be done. Mm-hmm. And then and if that's, been, and then the process of writing would run smoother if you're a little right. bit organized. Right, exactly. Yeah. If you just got these little too much, buckets. Yeah. If there's mm-hmm. too much just, in your head, sometimes you just go, <laughs> you know. And, and you that is what I deal I with. Like. Yeah, that's what I deal with with most of my clients <laughs> on productivity and project management coaching for authors is untangling that ball because Mm -hmm. especially if you're an indie author it's so much it's so overwhelming if they haven't done it 50 times already like many of us with a lot of experience have they're coming into Mm -hmm. this their first book the third book they're just overwhelmed and they're like i have to do the cover and i have to do it and then how do i line up reviews and how do i get art readers and it's just like oh there's a plan there's mm. a project let's put yeah. this all into the steps and figure out how things go let's make yeah. a little checklist i am a big proponent of checklist i love checklist you make a checklist and then you check the thing off and it just feels like you're making progress because you have a better grasp of all the elements and you aren't feeling overwhelmed yeah i'm just saying Shah's gonna love you yeah, she, she was so <laughs> sorry she couldn't be here today. Yeah, but, uh, she, she loves a good checklist, but, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love a good checklist. I love a good checklist. <laughs> yeah. 
And yeah. that's there's something about the checklist that that's kind of yeah. calming, and that you know it's on the checklist. You know that yeah. it's not you're not going to forget yeah. about it, and it doesn't mm. need to be done right the second. So you can always exactly. like it's something that's mm -hmm. going to be done. It's in the system. It's in in progress, and you can right now focus on presumably the writing that needs to get done or whatever you know, mm -hmm. and um, get the gratification. Oh, to get it off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, there have actually, so as a project, as a project manager, somebody who's in project, there have been studies done that show if you have a checklist at the start of a project and you use the checklist, it reduces accidents. Uh, it, it, it decreases delays. In other words, it prevents delays from happening. And it also improves accuracy. And this is true whether you're talking about heart surgery. This is true whether you're talking about uh, teaching kindergartners. If you have a checklist and you go through the checklist, you're, you're going to be more productive, you're going to be more efficient, and you're going to be much more calm about it. I was going to say less stressed. <laughs> yeah, Less stressed, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you know that if you're hitting the checklist, you're not going to be mm -hmm. overlooking something, which yeah. I think is what yeah. a lot of people get wrapped up in. Like, yeah. what am I yeah. forgetting? What am I missing? And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah, is my 100%. life, really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It's there's amazing. a reason why I like it. It's like I it's have to. That's why I've got it. someone. I've got someone who organises me. That's why. But, uh, but you, you are the you are the unicorn, Wendy, because it doesn't matter how fluffy and and out of whack you go. You are so productive. You get that <laughs> stuff done no matter what. <laughs> it's the one thing in my life that I can control. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all about determination and willpower. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Competitiveness. <laughs> Yeah, competitiveness gets done. I compete oh with myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, it, is there anything else in regards to product management, of oh, product management, mm -hmm. um, project management that um, that that is useful that we could, um, that you can talk about? I don't know what I don't know here. So lead us through. <laughs> well, I, I think we've hit some of the main points mm -hmm. is understanding yeah. the five stages. I, I think yeah. a lot of times if you just sit down and think, okay, what are the, if, where does this fall in the five stages of what I'm trying yeah. to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have people who try to do after action analysis before they've even finished. They're like, well, this wasn't working. I'm like, can we just finish, finish first and then yeah. let's review what we did. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, so, you know, the five stages, uh, a checklist, that would have been one that I would have brought up mm -hmm. at that question if we hadn't even already discussed it, just because if you've got a checklist it's so much easier. Um, a yeah. couple of projects that I've done, like I have a, a little handout that I give out a freebie that's a, um, a podcast checklist for people who are starting podcasts, right? And so a lot of times people who are starting podcasts, they don't know what they don't know. And so this checklist just says, here's all the things you're going to have to know. Here's a checklist yeah. for every episode. Every episode is going to go through this. Mm -hmm. And maybe you'll skip some things because it doesn't apply to your particular, like you, are you going to have downloadables or handouts on your podcast? Yes, no. Okay, you can take it off the checklist. But having that kind of checklist. You can do a checklist for writing a book. You can do a checklist for your marketing plan. You can do a checklist yeah. for every book, for, ev for, mar for every marketing plan, for every book. You can just break these things down into simple things organizational steps if you're feeling overwhelmed step back whether it's overwhelmed by the book itself whether it's overwhelmed by the marketing that you're having to do whether it's you're overwhelmed by the whole process step back think of the five steps put things into buckets just try to figure it out and break it down so that you can just see how it all fits together mm -hmm. rather than just throwing your hands up and going i don't know what to do next so mm -hmm. that's kind of my very straightforward advice it's just yeah. the basics yeah. I think that's, that's an awesome way to brilliant. Mm -hmm. that up. Yeah. 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 I do that. I write, if I don't write it down in my diary, often it doesn't get done. So it's almost like yeah. I can guarantee I'm going to get it done by writing it down in the diary. And yeah. often it's the things that I haven't written down that I don't mm -hmm. get about. And, I, exactly. Yeah. I'm a big believer in writing things down. It's just how my brain works. And people are like, you don't use one of those fancy project management apps. And I'm like, no, that's not how my brain works. I like writing things down yeah. so that I can track them and, and see where they are. I yeah. do use um, database like Notion database for collecting information. And like my entire marketing plan is run out of a database, but like my daily and weekly to-do lists are all written down. That's just, I just... The crossing the out part. I just love crossing yes. off. 
It just yeah. feels so good when I can cross yeah. something off. So. I, I feel that but if way. anybody is interested, yeah, my my book Rise to the Task, which is not specifically for writers, but it is about project management. It has worksheets and all sorts of stuff in there. So somebody can go take a look at that and maybe it'll help them get them straighten out their life a little mm. bit. Yeah, mm. that's brilliant. Thank you so much for that. It is so uh, good. Yeah, so we're, so we're good. kind of yeah. rolling into the end of the interview here now. So um I probably think that the next thing to ask is where's the best place to find you if someone wants to <laughs> look for you anywhere else in the world and, and re- get and your a books. cool website. Yeah, at the website and that Wendy cool loves. <laughs> uh, it is it is my website and uh, it's got everything. It's houseofyork.info. So that's house of York, all one word, dot I-N-F-O. Um, you'll find links to all my books. You'll find links to writers resources. I also run a writing community on discord for writers that's focused on productivity and, um, uh, well focused on product, uh, productivity and accountability I find I do a lot of co-writing sessions there we do a lot of sprints there um, people can talk about what's working for them productivity wise and what isn't um, there's links to that that's all there and also all my social media I have a link on that page called everything everywhere all at once and that links to all everything everywhere including my shops and my own podcasts uh, and social media yeah I think awesome. I covered it. That's it. You're yeah. It's all at that website. You'll find it. <laughs> You're awesome. a busy You're writer. You'll find it. Yeah. I am. Y'all. It's like um. some days it's, but I love it. See, that's just it. I just, I love yeah. podcasts. I love talking to other writers. I love mm-hmm. writing the books that I yeah. write. I love mm-hmm. the stories I want to, I just love it. Y'all. It's so much mm-hmm. fun to be a writer. It really that's is. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah. it is. Thank you so yes. much for joining us. We've had such yeah. a good time chatting to you here today. It's been it's awesome. Been great. I've, I've got lots of notes on project management. Not so much on the discovery writing, but you know. <laughs> She's like, you can have that. <laughs> you can have that. <laughs> well, you know, feel free to email me, right? Reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to talk to people, talk to you guys, talk to anyone about what might help them. Awesome. Oh, Thank yeah. you so much for Thank that. You. That's fantastic. And Cheryl, where can we be found if someone was? We can be found at spargirlspodcast.com on all social media, also on um, YouTube. And also on Patreon. So if you'd like to buy us a coffee or come and join our superstars group, we would love to have you. And um, yeah, come and check us out. Come and talk to us and come and watch the, uh, the video. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining us for another episode of the Spark Girls podcast. We'll be back again next week for, with um, another guest or another episode. But for now, farewell. Bye. Farewell. Bye. Bye. Bye.